Hey, Brad, I think we should do a podcast together. Oh, dude, really? Finally. I thought you would never ask. I mean, I was such a fan of everything you guys did at Tested. And like, it was so awesome when we would just like hang out in the Whiskey Media basement and talk tech all the time. And it was like, man, what if people could hear these conversations? What if we actually finally did a real podcast together and put it out into the world, which we've never done before at all? Clearly. Let's try it. Finally. I've been a fan for such a long time. And and like, I can't believe we've never had this idea before. We never thought to do this. But uh I really think we should do it, but I, I kind of don't know what, what, like, what do you think we should talk about? Um, well, I spend most of my time in a bash prompt these days, every chance I get. What do you think about shell scripts? Mm. Maybe seems a little narrow. Mm. Compiling software. I mean, get, maybe I think you've honed in on one incredibly small focused aspect of a larger pod. How about every possible uh, topic related to open source software, large and small on the planet. So you're saying a pod uh-huh. cast about free and open source software. Yeah, I think there's something there. Perhaps a FOSS pod. Well, now you're just being ridiculous. So, you know, I have interesting news for you, Brad. Uh-huh. The podcast is already in your feed. Oh, my God. That's where the last two weeks went. <laughs> that's what we've been doing. So yeah, we we're make, we're making a new we have we are this is a spin-off, I guess. Yes, spin-off is the word that's been in my head for this podcast. A compliment. This is complimentary to the flagship tech pod. Yes, of, of the of the large content town empire. Yes, the 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 USS Tech Pod. Um so yeah, we're we're launching a new podcast. It's actually already out. You we just didn't tell anybody until uh, we announced it here really. Yes. Uh but it's called The Foss Pod and uh it's a pre- presented by Brad and Will. That's mm-hmm. us. Yes. Uh and we are doing it because we realized that a it's one of our favorite kind of sub genres of tech pod episode. Like, I mean, yes. Anybody who hangs out on our Discord knows how much time I spend tinkering with open source projects and generally living in that world as much as I can. Well, but, but also the other thing we realized when we started talking about this is that there are a ton of open source, there's a ton of open source content and people talking about enterprise open source software, but there's hardly anybody that focuses on stuff for normal people. Yeah. There's not a lot of coverage of things that normal people can take advantage of in the open source world, but there are tons of things that people can take advantage of in the open source world. You know what I mean? Like there's tons of projects all over GitHub and other repositories just sitting there waiting for you to compile them and make your life a little bit. Yeah. Fr- from, from like all the way, starting from like the script that makes my MIDI interface into a controller for my digital mixer, which is like a few hundred lines of Python code that I downloaded from GitHub all the way up to like industry changing software, like the open broadcaster software. And y- you know, uh, Oh, you mean OBS? OBS. you know, I'm using one right now. I'm recording in Audacity right now. Same. We use we touch open source software all the time. It's incredibly important to normal people, and and from things like Home Assistant and TrueNAS all the way down to, you know, I don't know Firefox. How about uh, how about Own Tone, the little in house music server I use to replace iTunes, formerly known as Forked D A A P D. Oh, I think the new name is better, <laughs> but I think they still have some work to do there. Anyway. So we are going to do a new podcast. It happens every other week, which is either bi-weekly or bi- bi-monthly. I'm, I'm never quite sure. Maybe semi-weekly. Bi-weekly. Semi-weekly bi-weekly. would be twice a week, which... That's too much. You ready for to sign up for a twice a week podcast? G- give me a couple of... We need about 25 people to make that happen. Um, but we're going to do it every other week. Uh, we have a bunch of episodes planned. We would love to know topics that you all would find interesting. Yes, uh, for sure. And we're also looking for people to come in and be the third chair for us. So if you know somebody who you think would be a good third seat on the podcast, um, we're going to get you to post in the Discord and we'll have some some new channels set up in the Discord for FOSPOD folks uh, very soon. Also, I don't know if we mentioned it's the first episode is attached to this recording. Yeah, you're listening to it right now. So without further ado, here is the very first episode of Brad and Will Present. The Foss Pod. Hang on. Do I play the tech pod music to intro the Foss Pod? I think I'll, we just, I think, oh, wow. I don't even know. I'll make that decision in post. I'm going to make, here, I'll boop, de do boop, boop, bop, de boop, bop, bop, boop, 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 boop. Welcome to the Foss Pod, the first episode of the Foss Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Hello, Brad. Hi, Will. 
I think we might want to start by introducing ourselves. <laughs> it's probably a good way to start a new podcast. Yes. We're co-hosts of Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod, uh, a show we started a little bit more than two years ago as a way to do a single topic technology podcast every week. And in the process of doing that, we found out that we talked a lot about open source software and we're really interested in open source software. Yeah, I think it's kind of unavoidable these days, right? Like that it is at the root of so much of what makes the internet go, but also as a, a consumer and end user, I guess I would say, not as a developer, not as somebody who writes open source code, but as somebody who likes to stream music and play video games and run video game servers for my friends and things like that, you know, it's it's very empowering to get your head around this stuff and see what's out there and realize that like, hey, I don't have to be a developer to make use a lot of, of a lot of the cool open source stuff that's available. The list goes on and on and on of cool things you can do around the house and like online with your friends. If you've got just kind of a, a basic working knowledge, you know, it's felt really satisfying to understand it and use it. Like, I think we kind of wanted to share that passion and that joy and satisfaction uh, with the rest of the world. Okay. So we spent a lot of time talking about open source software. We realized there's a ton of media out there about open source in the enterprise. There's not a lot of people talking about consumer focused open source projects. So things like Home Assistant or the Mr. Project or the open broadcaster software, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yes. We started talking about the show and we were introduced to the folks at Google's open source software group, where their tagline is bringing all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source, which is a very broad mandate. It really is. We found out that we shared a lot of things in common and they decided to sponsor the show. So this show is brought to you by Google's open source software. And yeah, you can find out more about them at opensource.google. Uh, things you can expect every other week from the show. Uh, we're going to talk to folks who make open source software. We're going to talk to maintainers. We're going to talk to the people who write code and the people who do this, do this kind of behind the scenes work on the software that makes the internet work and the software that makes a lot of the, the hardware and software that we all use every day works. Uh, we're also going to kind of dive in and do some some hands on stuff. So we're going to get our hands dirty and, and use some of these projects that we've talked about on the tech pod before, but also that we use on the day to day and and share why we're excited about them and what we use them for and things like that. Yeah. You know, like I just I feel very passionate about open source, honestly. I mean, like uh, there's the day to day aspect of like, hey, you know, there's a lot of things you can benefit from personally by using this stuff, but also just philosophically, I feel like in a world where increasingly everything is driven by profit motive. Like I kind of want to just dig into this world of people that are working more as a collective, you know, like in this collaborationist sort of spirit of just doing cool work and putting it out into the world, you know, and building, building on each other, you know, standing on each other's shoulders. Like there is such a kind of inspiring spirit to the open source community and philosophy to me that I really wanted to dig into and kind of understand what drives that. And like you said, by talking to some of the people behind some of the biggest open source projects out there. Like, I hope we can start to uncover some of those answers. So that's it. That's the show. Our first episode is about OBS, the open broadcaster software. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk to the maintainer, Jim Bailey, who's been doing this since the very beginning, 10 years ago. And I guess we should probably start the music. So the show starts. Hey, let's, let's do a podcast. <laughs> What is OBS? Well, Will, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it, I mean, it, but it's complicated, right? There's a perception that OBS is a tool for streamers. It's a thing that you use if you want to if you want to stream Call of Duty on Twitch to your legions of adoring fans. You need to get this thing and you need to get a bunch of overlays and all these flashy lights and uh, things that make fart noises and all sorts of other stuff. But in reality, it's a lot more and it's much more of a consumer focused application, especially post pandemic than it was before. Right. It's I mean, it's it's not wrong that it is absolutely the thing you use to stream Call of Duty to Twitch, but it does do a lot more than that. Like it has a lot of applications outside of streaming video games. It can handle so many different types of video and audio ins and outs. Like it, it has a lot of versatility that I think people who just use it to stream games maybe have not entirely gotten their heads around. Well, and the trick with live mixed video, which is what OBS is a video mixer. It does other stuff, too. But at the end of the day, the reason you use a live mix process is so that you can make make a video, a piece of video content that you are producing look like something that was edited in a video editor like Premiere, but do it live. You can use it to put like to switch camera angles or to put those bottom thirds on that say, hey, this is Brad Shoemaker of the Foss Pod uh, when somebody's headshots on stuff like that. 
the the interesting thing to me about this is that you know you and I started streaming and doing video game like live stream with video games and podcasts in the like late 2000s, right? Yes. Probably about 15 years ago was I've worked at GameSpot ages and ages ago and turnkey streaming solutions did not exist at that time. No, our streaming solution when we were working together in in 2010 was a hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars worth of PC hardware and video capture stuff and H two sixty four hardware encoders that had a bunch of proprietary closed source software on them, and it all was kind of it was still kind of all cobbled together. And that was the cheap way to do it, right? Right? Like we we spent as little money as possible. If you wanted to do it the real way, with air quotes. That was a couple mil easy to set that stuff up in 2010 or 2009. Right. And even even for the bargain basement price of like 100 grand, you know, it was still it was a lot of heavy, rugged metal boxes. It was SDI cables like it was stuff that the average person has never heard of and probably has no interest in hearing about because it's not that relevant to them outside of this one specific application of streaming. Honestly, I think that's another reason that OBS is a great way to kick the show off is that like that's kind of been the role of open source software in a lot of cases is to democratize things that originally were out of reach of the average person by delivering this like smaller, more focused, more freely available version. Uh, And it it, like it is honestly just straight up astonishing to me a decade later where we're at in terms of how much this one piece of software lets a single person do that. It took a studio of people and all that gear to do just like 10 years ago. Well, and and so you might say, but wait, I can stream to Twitch or YouTube or whatever from an app on my phone. I don't need OBS anymore. But it, it turns out. There's a path that content creators tend to follow where they start out by streaming from their Xbox or their PlayStation using the app that's built into the platform, or they use one of the tools that comes with Windows or with their video card driver or something like that. But then they reach a certain point and they realize that they need more functionality and more access to the to the low level hardware stuff where they want higher frame rates or better image quality or whatever. And that's when OBS comes into play still. You know, it's the market leader in this space for a reason. And it's because everybody uses it uh, you know, from from the person that has literally nobody watching them on their on their third time stream all the way up to you know somebody who has 50 or 60,000 people watching them on, on the front page of Twitch. And and none of that would have happened without OBS and the software that kind of spawned off the ecosystem that grew up around OBS. Well, we'll talk about this more later. But even at the time when OBS came out, the the streaming solutions you could get your hands on at the consumer level still came with either, you know, pretty hefty single purchase fees or like ongoing subscription prices. I mean, there were still barriers to entry to getting into the space that the average person who just wants to try it out probably were not going to try to surmount. Right. So. I think that's as good a place as any to jump into our conversation with Jim Bailey, who's uh, started OBS almost 10 years ago now and has been maintaining the code ever since. You know, it's grown from a little project that, as far as I can tell, started when he posted on Reddit that he wanted he built this piece of software to stream him playing StarCraft, I think. It is a piece of history. It's right there in the Wikipedia footnotes, the post on Reddit that survives to this day where he said, like, hey, I wanted to stream StarCraft better, so I made my own software to do it. Back in those days, I pretty much just loved watching StarCraft, loved playing StarCraft, and I kind of wanted to stream it myself, but, I, you know, there was there were a lot of hurdles he had to go through to be able to do that. And so I was just, I already enjoyed programming a lot. I've been a programmer since I was like eight years old, so I just pretty much program tools that I want to make for myself. Uh, so I started working on it. I was just bored. I was jobless. And it just kind of exploded, you know, after I announced it, everybody, you know, jumped on it, you know, and I started meeting new people instantly and started learning so much from everybody. It was uh, pretty crazy. I wasn't really expecting it. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't really aware of like the streaming situation in general. It was just pretty much primarily focused on like Justin TV back then, you know, with people streaming StarCraft. And that's, that's where my mindset was. So... I had no idea what I was getting myself into or what other software was out there. <laughs> you know, I eventually learned there was like a professional software like uh, Wirecast out there that, yeah, it was pretty crazy to to learn uh, about the industry and uh, get involved in it, just like at the drop of that. Was there ever a question in your mind when, when you, when you kind of had the creative spark that you were like, hey, I, I'm going to make my own streaming software because this needs to exist? Was there ever a doubt in your mind that it would be an open source project? Like, did you ever even consider keeping it closed or was that just kind of part of the mission statement from moment one? It was pretty much a mission, mission statement from moment one. I, was, I loved open source software and I loved, you know, free open source software in particular, you know, you know GPL software. 
because, you know, it just kind of enforces the software to be free and that if, if everybody uses it, you know, they need to have access to the source code and need to be able to have that freedom to be able to do what they want with it. And that was something that I found really appealing. You know, I, I didn't know how popular it would become, but I did have a feeling that it might be like something that could turn my life around just a little bit. And, you know, and it certainly did. What changed? So you said you were unemployed when you wrote OBS and like, at, at what point did you look up and you're like, oh, wow, I can't like, what, at what point did you start working on this? I mean, I guess you were kind of working on it full time from the beginning, but when, what was your moment that you realized, oh, this software I wrote to stream some Starcraft maybe is going to make a significant change to my life and my, and my path going forward. When people started uh, paying me money for it, you know, I, I started getting contracts from companies and things like that, you know, so many different parties were interested in, in not just the users. And, and uh, you know, once I started actually making money, you know, I, I realized, okay, this is actually it. I finally managed to get myself out of uh, my terrible situation. How long did that take? I mean, you know, we're coming up on basically 10 years, a decade of OBS at this point. How how long did it take before you started earning some money and, and the thought occurred to you like, oh, this could be my full time job? Like, was that a, a long period of years? Were there like lean times at the beginning, a lot of ramen, that kind of situation? Or Well, I started getting opportunities within the first few months after the first release. It was I was very, very happy about it. And I'm pretty sure I cried. Uh, I wasn't sure if it would keep going or not, because I, I, that's, that's just something I was afraid of constantly. You know, it's like year by year, I was like, is this really going to keep continuing or is it just going to end? You know, it's like, or, you know, I'd have moments where like, this is it. It's, it's over. It's done. You know, because, you know, when you're contracted with companies, you know, uh, sometimes they'll like forget to pay you or, you know, that they have some issue with their paying process and, you know, you just, you just don't get that payment and you're just sitting there thinking, this is, this is it. I guess this is over. I guess I had a good run, but I guess I'm going back to the situation I was already in. But, uh, you know, 10 years later, it's just like, uh, here we are. And I am, I'm actually able to pay multiple people, uh, to work on the project. Uh, so it was this constant fear that I had to just ride through every second of it until, you know, there was like this point where it was like, okay, we're earning enough money to where we can pay multiple people. And that's when I was like, started kind of relaxing. It's like, uh, well, I, I guess it's fine. We have multiple sponsors now. Uh, I guess I don't really have anything to be worried about anymore. I, I have to imagine there was a moment at some point where you looked up and looked around at what else was out there and, were like, and, and realized, oh, hey, we went from being the scrappy open source underdog to being the market leader in this new and exploding space. And that had to be a really amazing feeling, too. I think the most amazing thing for me was just the wonderful people I met and uh, the wonderful team that I've created uh, somehow or another. Or that it's not really so much that I created it, but it kind of created itself. And uh, I, it's not it wasn't really m so much me. It was just the wonderful people that I met that really just drove the software to be what it is today, in my humble opinion, at least. I feel like the communities around things like open source software and and you, you know, the communities that the Internet sp spawns tend to be tend to form up around people based on their ethos and and behavior and and it, it, you know I, I think you have to take a little bit of credit for that but maybe but uh <laughs> but but surrounding yourself with good people is definitely a uh, important on on something like this and of course yeah these days i'm not the one writing most code i'm mostly just merging other people's code so it's definitely shifted uh i definitely i definitely got the ball rolling uh and uh, I, I i learned so much it was absolutely incredible just all the people that I met and it wasn't just that I learned so much, but it was also like meeting people who knew more than me and I would just follow their lead and things like that. So now you might be thinking, wow, I should probably install OBS. It seems like a really useful piece of software. Get ready to open the can of worms. Look, we've both done this a fair amount. While it is an incredibly powerful piece of software and the evolution of the UI and user experience has, has, come a long way over the last 10 years, it's still a little intense when you start out. 
yeah, it's if you've got, you know, if you've got experience in broadcast or, or video editing or whatever, a lot of these concepts are going to be pretty familiar to you. But if you've never done video switching live and that sort of thing, like some of some of the conceptual stuff is maybe a lot to get your head around. Well, yeah. And, and most of us aren't used to thinking about video as something that can be manipulated in this way. You think about being able to edit video to chop up, you know, to make cuts in video and switch from one cut to another one take to another or whatever. But you don't think about being able to do that live on the fly. And um, OBS lets you do that. It's it's a it's an incredibly powerful tool in that regard. Now, it uses some some words, some lingo to describe the different things that are available to you inside the application. Some some jargon, some terms of art. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so let's let's start at the very beginning with sources. A source is basically any it's the, the smallest chunk of content you can put on the scene. It's anything you can put on the screen from another video, something that you pull off of your computer, like a like the dis, your main display from your computer, a video capture device like a camera or a capture card. It can also be a way like text text overlay on the screen. It can be a Web page like the, there is Chromium is built into OBS. So you can just render a Web page right there in the middle of your of your scene images you can pull other streams into your stream into your as a source <laughs> if you do it right it's a little complicated but you can drop a network address to another stream in and stream that stream into your stream as you stream so you can stream while you're streaming it's a stream exception okay oh, no we have to move on okay so scenes are collections of sources so you have your sources are the least, least lowest lowest item of the of the chain scenes are collections of those and um, if you think about like in the context of, say, an interview show where you have a person doing an interview, talking to somebody else, you switch back and forth between those two camera viewpoints and uh, th that's switching between scenes. So you set up each scene to have all the elements that you want to have in that scene, and then you can flip flop back and forth between them really easily, which I think is the funnest thing about streaming personally. I mean, that's just me, but like managing all these different scenes and like. You can queue up the next scene, you know, without it actually going out live on, on the stream and then just kind of toggle back and forth. Like it's it's very powerful for letting you kind of chain stuff together, like queue stuff up and have it ready to switch like that. That interplay of kind of like it's almost like this sort of puppet master thing of like switching and, 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 and you know, it's 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 very entertaining. Well, it's, it's fun. It, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to do the work on those on those setups. Most streamers, it turns out, use one scene. Really? Like they just have the one with their picture of their headshot in the video game and then they never touch it. It turns out. So that's the joy of streaming to me. <laughs> it's really kind of masterminding that stuff. But well, OK, so then we have projectors. Projectors are things that can be tied to sources or scenes. So it's like the output of that scene. And you can put it on another monitor if you want to if you want to use like two or three, you know, chain a bunch of computers together with capture cards and HDMI outputs. You can put one projector on the output and pick it up as a capture device on the next machine. And, and like uh, there there are DJs and artists on Twitch who do all sorts of amazing video glitch art by just hooking up bazillions of computers and motion capture and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, you can also these aren't exactly projectors, but you can also embed scenes as sources in other scenes. OK, so like you can take a scene that has. For example, the bottom third that introduces your show and you can use that as a source that you can flip on when you want to like come back from a from a break or whatever at any given moment. So that means you don't have to have that resource in every single scene. Uh, you just put, build it once and then you you dump it into the scene and it displays based on the rules that you set up in the first scene, which is kind of cool. You can end up with some extremely complicated kind of hierarchical arrangements of scenes and sources and projectors that kind of nested inside of each other. I mean, it. And I think that can kind of be endless, right? Like you can sort of just nest and build and stack things as long as you want. It seems like it's limited by memory and and right. and the power of your machine. But if you're willing to hook up multiple machines, you can do anything. It's kind of like when the Beatles wanted 16 track audio recordings, but only had four track recorders. So they just used four four track recorders. And, you know, I guess life found a way. I don't know. There's also scene collections, which are unsurprisingly collections of scenes. It's a way for you to switch, say you have one set of art and one set of scenes for your talk show, you have a different set of scenes for a video game show. You can easily switch back and forth between those. So you only have this have to load the scenes that you're going to use at any given time. Uh, and then profiles are the settings for OBS. So it's stuff like your recording format and which services you're outputting to and uh, hotkeys and all that kind of stuff gets saved in your profiles. And that'll let you change between for example, if you want to record at 4K or stream at 1080p, you can set up a profile for each of those and switch between them relatively easily. 
Yeah, if, if you're not familiar with OBS, this probably sounds like a lot of heady terminology and conceptual stuff. But like it's one of the things I found over the course of this interview is that I think Jim is aware of that. You know, like it sounds like there is kind of a tension here of like, I mean, it's an amazingly extensible program. Like it can do an incredible amount of stuff if you kind of bend it to your will. But like you get the sense that he really has to think hard about like, how do I expose all of this like ridiculously complex functionality to people without just completely overwhelming them with, you know, UI and concepts all over the place. It's funny because in the time since I've started using OBS, like streaming has gone from a thing that nobody understood and thought was strange and and a weird fringe use of computers and video games to a super mainstream thing that like my nine year old daughter's friends were all like, I want to be a streamer when I grow up. And and it's 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 been an amazing transformation over this last 10 years. I think it's probably in no small part due to software like OBS, you know, things that are readily available and and that everybody can download and, and do this on their computer at home. It's kind of crazy. Most of the users are actually young people. So many people want to become content creators. And uh, I, I remember reading an article uh, that said that kids, their most desired professions these days are to become YouTubers or streamers. It's It's pretty nuts. It's pretty nuts. What does it feel like being the project maintainer of something that is at this point like such a bedrock piece of the kind of Internet ecosystem? I mean, is there a lot of pressure associated with that being this kind of like, you know, like you're pretty low on the Jenga tower of Internet technologies at this point, right? Like, yeah. Does that cause a lot of stress for you or is there or is it just kind of a put on blinders and just focus on making good software? A little bit of both. Uh, sometimes it can be a lot of pressure and sometimes uh, I just kind of get into the zone and, you know, I've been doing this for so long now. It's been almost 10 years. It's crazy. And it's it just keeps going. I, I, I don't know. It, it, technologies keep evolving and it just keeps people keep needing new features and uh, companies keep needing new modifications, new codecs coming out all the time. And it's, uh, I have like three or four companies right now that are just like vying for my attention constantly. And it's, uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but, uh, somehow we're managing to do it. And, uh, currently I'm the only main maintainer. So it can be a little bit overwhelming. The reason why that is, is because getting really high skilled people that are experienced enough to be able to handle maintaining especially for a project like this where you know you have to have like video graphics audio knowledge encoding knowledge it's extremely difficult so often what happens is everything gets funneled through myself Uh, so the project moves a lot slower than i would prefer but we've been making some adjustments recently and it's uh it's been much better but there's still some things that that I wish we could do better. I mean, it's it's kind of an innovator's dilemma situation, right? Typically the generalist that's able to, you know, the the person who's enough of a generalist to be able to get something started maybe isn't, isn't necessarily the right person to be a specialist when you get to a point that you need a specialist working on the, on, on the software. How did you find, did you find that to be a transition point for you? Or was that a, was that it just kind of worked itself out as you were going on you had the job of maintaining the project um, and, and keeping the community cohesive and and working together and stuff like that i still have trouble finding specialists (laughs) to be honest most of the people who have joined the project and have become some of the best contributors are people who were kind of in my same situation um we didn't really know what we were getting into we didn't really have the experience when we started and we just kind of learned as we went and uh, uh there were a few people that were like amazingly good you know these amazingly good programmers would come and go you know as they please Uh, (laughs) that's usually how it goes usually the really good programmers already have like high paying jobs especially in this industry because i mean it's video audio graphics encoding and this this stuff is incredibly complicated so if you get like a good programmer it's guaranteed that those programmers are going to be uh somewhere in some industry out there, probably working in San Francisco, making uh, hundreds of G's per year. So if you can't compete on financial terms for talent, is there kind of a philosophical appeal you can make to people? I mean, do you find there's like a certain personality that enjoys open source as a way of working and as a philosophy? And it's kind of obviously you've got sponsorship, you know, you, you can support yourself working on this project full time, but there's still 
is there still kind of an essence of like giving back to the world, to the community, to to share open code and to make this freely available product like the, that kind of attracts certain people? I think those sort of people, uh, it depends on their interest. Sometimes they uh, come around, you know, because they're interested in the project and they'll contribute, you know, their little pieces. Like I've got one programmer who is incredibly talented, but... <laughs> I could never hope to hire him with uh, our budget, unfortunately, but he's in the game industry and he's, uh, he enjoys like streaming and, uh, being able to record his content and, uh, having the software be really high quality is really important to him. You know, he likes like color precision, you know, he likes making sure that the software has a uh, really good performance so it doesn't, uh, interfere with his, whatever he's working on, you know, whatever game that he's making, uh, so we have like regular contributors like that. And sometimes I can, uh, you know, contract them to do like certain jobs. So I have been able to get some of them to be able to help out from time to time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny. We we make a quite a fair amount of uh, income to be able to afford paying multiple people, but we still don't have that sort of income that we would need to be able to hire this specific sort of uh, talent that uh, we really, really need, like uh, that sort of individual to be able to do the sort of work that we really need, which is uh, particularly maintaining. Uh, ma maintaining is incredibly difficult because you have to be very experienced and you have to know like the ins and outs of not just the software itself, but you know, the, the systems that the software use. So if you're doing encoding, if you're doing graphics, you have to have like specializations in all these different areas. And those sort of people are incredibly hard to come by. You know, it's like, I wish that I could hire those sort of people. It's, it's just funny because we make such a fair amount of money. Yeah. We still, we're still like quite a bit below the, <laughs> the uh income level that we would need to be able to hire those sort of people uh full time it's uh kind of a kind of a funny situation to be in i think anybody who hires engineers on the reg is is feel, feels that same pain <laughs> jim um do you, like some of your corporate sponsors provide engineering support as well like do you have corporations that are like hey we're going to give you an engineer to work on whatever feature x that we want supported if you all will integrate it is that a thing that happens or or not so much sometimes yeah I'd say it happens at least around half the time. They definitely do try to help out the best that they can, usually. What's the code review process like for, for something like that? Is it just like you get somebody in to take a look at who, who has the same basic competency or is it just you try it and see what works? <laughs> uh, code review. That's, that's a uh, topic in and of itself. Uh, one example that I can think of is, uh, you know, there's a big pull request coming up from one of our sponsors, you know, because they really want this specific feature. And, you know, it's it's going to be like tens of thousands of lines long and it's it's pretty nuts. So I had to I basically had to hire somebody else to help me out with that and to be able to properly review that. And uh, it was it's going to be very expensive, but uh it was just so much beyond my own capability that I just had no choice in the matter to do that there. Usually I can get through it myself. It just depends like on what the changes are. And if it's like a 10,000 line plus uh, code review, then uh, usually what happens is it just ends up uh, kind of sitting there for sometimes months just because it's so difficult to get through those. It's incredibly difficult. I'm I'm really curious about the dynamics of corporate sponsorship of an open source, a free and open source project. Um, you, you mentioned that some of your corporate sponsors, you know, you've got some, some pretty prominent ones as far as the streaming context, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Logitech, and video, you've got all listed on your website. You mentioned that they will make kind of feature requests of you, but how, how involved are they in your day to day and the direction of the project? Like, did, is there a give and take? Like, do they share their, I assume their product roadmaps with you to some extent to help guide you know, the direction of the project from that direction, how hands-on are they? For some of them, we have uh, bi-weekly meetings or monthly or quarterly meetings. Uh, uh, some of them are very hands-off. Some of them are just happy that the project exists and want to fund it to keep it existing because it, you know, benefits their user base. So sometimes you get lucky like that and you just get like a sponsor who uh, is just like, hey, keep doing what you're doing, you know, and just... Uh, kind of throws their hat into the pool 
and uh, sometimes you get ones that uh, want like weekly and in- biweekly involvement and you know just a meet up and sync and uh, things like that. So I'd say it's it's another one of those situations where it's about half and half. How do you prioritize new features? Like, like I'm curious, like what you're do you, like, do you have a thought process that you go through for everything, or do you kind of take it on a case by case basis, or is there like a like a collection period where you talk to the different involved parties and users and feedback from the from the different community areas that you have? Well, we I have a team that helps out with that, and we all decide collectively what needs to be worked on and what you know can be put uh, on the back burner and things like that are there common paths for people who want to become contributors to obs like is it come in and you know do some pull requests and write some code and then you know more and more and more and then all of a sudden you're working full-time on the project or is it a little more amorphous than that the best way to become a contributor is is firstly to get involved with the community you know see what we're doing see what's up Make comments, you know, uh, if if you feel like you're experienced with something, you know, you can take a look at stuff and see if anything can be improved. Or if you have some particular interest, you can make a pull request uh, for something you're interested in. Most of the time when a contributor comes around, they're usually trying to add a feature that they're specifically interested in, which is usually fine. Well, we would generally prefer it if uh, if, uh, if you're going to write stuff that it's going to benefit the majority of the users uh, rather than, you know, some specific niche use case. You know, there are always little things like that that help out a lot. Uh, yeah, just getting involved in the community, uh, being proactive, uh, especially being positive. You know, we, we really uh, value our contributors, you know, being upstanding people and things like that, patient, all the good things that you would expect from you know, just a mature individual. Good at giving and receiving feedback, working for the team, all, all the usual things that you, that you want in a, in a, in a coworker or a teammate, right? Uh-huh. At the start of the pandemic, you, you all rolled out, uh, the, the virtual camera support suddenly became a really prominent feature and I think helped a bunch of people. And I was, it seems like it took you one step closer to being like a pure consumer product rather than a content creator product, which I thought was really interesting. I remember when uh, the pandemic started, uh, pretty much our entire team was like, we need this like right now. It's it's super important. So I basically had to stop everything I was doing. I uh, went through our current plugins, you know, because there were there were plugins that supported it. But the problem was that I didn't really like how they were handling it. There was a massive delay. There was like multiple hundreds of milliseconds. I was like, no, this isn't going to be acceptable for like real time communication. So I had to, I went over the code and I had to figure out how to get it as low latency as possible. I uh, nailed it down to about one or two frames maximum latency. And after that, I was like, okay, this should be good. (laughs) And then, you know, inevitably people were asking, you know, for virtual audio support, you know, audio output from OBS into their uh, programs. And that was, I was like, oh, no, that's not going to happen. So, <laughs> but at least the uh, virtual video ended up being a complete success. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that one. I actually had to work on that one myself just because it was just such a pressing issue. So I basically stopped everything I was doing, everything I was reviewing. And uh, I started hammering it out, you know, until it was done. Listening to Jim talk about adding the virtual camera support really kind of exemplifies one of the things I love so much about the kind of open source movement and community and philosophy, which is that it's a bunch of people doing the work, I think, largely because they love it, right? And they want it to be the best it can be, you know? I mean, he talks about, like, the the plugins that were out there for that feature were at, you know, 100 milliseconds of latency, which is just not acceptable, which, A, he's right about. But, B, he put the work in to get that latency down to basically nothing. Like, a frame or two of latency might as well not exist. And that's what I get out of a lot of the open source projects that I touch is that the people that are doing them are doing it primarily because they love good software, because they want to add functionality to the world by writing good software, that they kind of enjoy the pursuit of perfection, at least as it is defined within their, the, the scope of the little project that they're doing. You know what I mean? Like he, like he put the work in to make that thing as good as it could be in this project that exists on the, the sponsorship and goodwill of a few companies and end users, right? Well, and that's the thing. Like this started as Jim wanting to stream StarCraft 
in 2012. He built the software. He built this team. Like he's he's a really sweet, unassuming guy who just likes talking about the the tool that he makes that he's making. And it's really hard to remember that he's in charge of this software that's kind of a juggernaut in this this exploding industry right now. So and at the same time as all that, while OBS is really, really important and and is helping drive this whole thing forward, you know, you look at what's happening on on Twitch and on YouTube gaming and YouTube street live streaming and Facebook gaming and all the other places around the world that that games are streamed and people are live streaming with OBS it's still really underfunded compared to what a commercial product of similar scale would be. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to hear him and kind of almost in the same breath talk about, you know, they're doing well for, for who they are and for what they need. You know, he says like he, they, they make pretty good income, but at the same time he can't go out and get the kind of like Silicon Valley talent that they would truly need to add like all the advanced features that they, that they would like to have. Right. Like it's this, again, this tension of the, the free software model kind of running up against the requirements of living in the world. Well, and p- part of that is, I think, a unique problem to OBS because, you know, when you're talking about subsets of subsets of subsets and when you're talking about engineers who have like video codec expertise are there's not very many of them compared to software developers and engineers in other specialties. And those people have really, really huge demands when you look at like Netflix doing double digit percentages of all traffic on the Internet because they stream so much video. So it, you know, it's an interesting place for Jim and it and it gave us a good opportunity to talk about what the future of the project is as he sees it and where he's going uh, and, and what he views as his contribution for the next 10 or more years of OBS. So you've been, you've been at this for almost 10 years now. Are you going to keep at it forever, Jim? Is this is this the, the remainder of your career, you think? It's it's pretty much all I've ever had. Uh, so uh, it's very important to me. So uh, I'll continue doing it as long as I human as as is humanly possible. Uh, I would love to get back into video games because I was originally trying to be a video game developer. But you know how video games are. Video game industry is completely saturated, and it's uh, very difficult to get get into, and especially to be successful. You could make a great game, and then you could only make like hundred thousand dollars on that single video game or something like that. And I know that $100,000 seems like much, but I mean, I'm talking like over a period of years and that ends up being kind of bad. It's hit driven in a way that's yeah. that's really dangerous. Uh, yeah, I would love to be able to get into games and I'm, I am working on my own game. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll ever come out <laughs> because uh, uh, let's face it, OBS is, takes up uh, almost all of my time. But uh, like, are you, have you established structures inside the project that if if like you're not able to work on it anymore, you decide to you just like, I'm done, I'm walking away, the project will go on? Or is that you're not not at that point yet? No, I, I feel like it's actually at that point. If uh, something ever happens to me, I'm pretty sure that the project is in very good hands at this point. There are just so many good people who are working on it all the time. Uh, I, I am actually not worried about that in the slightest. I would have been worried about that a few years ago. But these days, yeah, I, you know, the project is just basically churning by itself. And it's really nice to see. And the fact that it's uh, so well sponsored uh, is really what drives it. You know, everybody, I'm actually able to pay everybody. And uh, as long as that's uh, something that can keep going on uh, in my absence, uh, should something ever happen to me, for example, I'm pretty confident that it will uh, keep going and uh, somebody else will be able to take up the mantle and take my place. Uh, you know, you don't want to be subject to the, uh, what is it called where you're hit, the hit by the truck syndrome? Oh, the bus proofing is what we call it at our studio. Yes. Yes. You, you definitely don't want to be in that situation. And not, fortunately we're not, fortunately we're not. Um, I'm, I'm curious from a legal standpoint, like what defines ownership of a project like this? I mean, you know, in, in a private company, obviously it's a private company and it owns its intellectual property and so forth. But in a free and open source context, if you were to hand maintenance of the project over to someone else, for example, are there legal considerations there or is it truly open even from an ownership standpoint that you could just kind of do that? We don't have contributor license agreements. So everybody has their own little piece of the project. Uh, We would have to get permission from users or not from users, from uh, contributors if uh, we ever wanted to um, do anything with the project. And um, I feel like uh, if that scenario, you know, the hit by the bus scenario ever happens, uh, it would probably be a little bit of a pain to get the trademarks and uh, 
uh, settled, but uh, that would be pretty much it, I feel. Just the transferring trademarks uh, over to somebody else or transferring uh, rights of the company that own, owns the trademarks, my company, uh, over to somebody else. Uh, that would probably be the only uh, stepping stone. So pie in the sky question. Mm -hmm. If you had infinite time and infinite resources, is there is there any one thing that you would just love to add to OBS? Is there is there anything about it that's like your kind of top of your wish list would love to be able to do at some point? I feel like, well, obviously, the first thing I would do is hire like a legion of highly skilled maintainers just so we can get stuff through and get better uh, or faster code review and uh, better code review because uh, having everything funneled through me is just not going to cut it. That would be like if I had like infinite resources, that would be like the top. We just like have a hierarchy of uh, maintainers similar to Linux or something like that. <laughs> That would be so nice, but uh, we're managing to do pretty okay without that. So what other features would I really want? I know that um, one of the big issues for um, a lot of users is that they have a single monitor. And, uh, you know, if you want to be able to use OBS, you have to constantly alt tab between OBS and, you know, if you're capturing a game, your game. And uh, it just doesn't make a very good experience. So I know that w one thing that we really need is uh, overlay support for games. And it's, it's just so complicated. I just don't want to do it. I just don't <laughs> want it. I'm so done with the game capture stuff and having to hook into video games. It's just like, I just want to uh, put that aside uh, as much as possible. It's kind of like working on anything related to direct show. I don't want anything to do with it anymore, <laughs> especially after virtual cam, which was all direct show code. It's the, and it's the API I hate, I hate the most. I just hate working with it. It's so incredibly painful, but yeah, I would just hire a league, a league of maintainers at this point. I'm curious to how you feel about the general state of real-time streaming right now in terms of, you know, codecs and protocols like the tech end, because it feels like H.264 and RTMP still rule the world and they have for basically the last decade, right? But there are all these successor technologies out there that feel like they're just waiting for somebody to adopt them. Do you feel like, you know, as 4K becomes a bigger thing, do you feel like we're going to be moving into territory where some of the protocols with lower latency, some of the codecs with better efficiency are going to start being adopted by the, the major players? Uh, yeah, I have a lot to say about all of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, just because this is one of those things that I just hear about a lot from uh, a lot of the sponsors, you know, they want all of those things, you know, they want 4k lower latency, you know, they want newer codecs or they want to switch protocols or they want this feature or that feature. And uh, uh, for codecs, uh, yeah, H264, I don't see it not being a dominant force in five years. I still feel like in five years, it'll still be a dominant force, but I am trying to move things towards uh, the newer proto the, new the uh, newer codecs, such as uh, particularly AV1, because the thing I like about AV1 is that it's royalty free. You know, and that's a, that's a thing that uh, all of those big companies really like about it. But, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's something that I've been pushing. I actually added AV1 support uh, for the most recent beta patch and uh, I'm pretty proud of it. And actually AV1 runs pretty well uh, as long as you have enough cores. This is, oh, this is all software encoding. I'm hoping that eventually we'll see AV1 hardware encoders sooner than later. We already have uh, hardware encoders for HEVC, but the problem with HEVC is that, you know, royalties again, and we're not even sure if we're allowed to use it or not. We might just be limited to hardware encoders for it. Uh, we'll see where we need to check the uh, patent pool to make sure that we uh, aren't liable for <laughs> massive payments or anything like that, because that's something that I don't know if we could afford <laughs> on our budget. I was going to say, is that is that a thing that like your corporate sponsors can help with? Can like if you're if you're working with Google, can they sub license out access to patent pools and stuff like that? Or is that a thing that doesn't the world doesn't work that way? I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Uh, that would be nice if they did. But I think usually what's going to happen is they're going to probably cover it for their own websites and, <laughs> because they don't want to have to cover for like somebody else's website, you know, so it kind of becomes complicated in that respect, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I have to imagine it's a, it's an absolute nightmare dealing with like IP as an open source project and dealing with the codec licensing. Yeah. It's a mess. It is a mess. It's a nightmare. You talk about the virtual camera support beginning as a plugin. How do you feel about the state of the plugin ecosystem in OBS at this point? Have, are you still are you still using the the same API for plugins that you were at the beginning? Has there been any any change or evolution there? <laughs> our, our API has not changed in 
around eight years. It's pretty ancient at this point and antiquated. It needs a major update. Uh, for the plugin ecosystem, uh, I'm not happy with how you have to install plugins. I mean, you have to like download a plugin zip. You have to like move it into the right location so the OBS will see it. And then, you know, you have to open up OBS. And as, for most people, you know, that's asking a little bit much because, you know, they don't want to have to mess with their folders on their system or anything to be able to get a plugin working. They just want to be able to, you know, click a button and get it installed. To the average user, yeah, that's, it's a bit much. It's kind of like installing a Minecraft plugin. Uh, Minecraft still has a problem with that to this day. It's kind of crazy. But uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to make it so you can grab and install plugins from within the program itself. And uh, that way we can kind of control, uh, you know, uh, well, it's not about control, actually. It's more about making it easier for the user. Uh, but what we're really trying to do is just keep things stable. And uh, hopefully uh, in version 28, uh, this is kind of a, we haven't really told people about this. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to get in trouble for telling people about this, but we really want to make the plugin manager and I've already put in a little bit of work for that. So basically you would uh, open up the program and uh, open up the plugin manager within the program and uh, be able to browse and install plugin, common plugins that uh, uh, people use every day and just be able to install it easily within the program. That way you don't have to like download a zip file and move the files into some particular location or something like that. And it has the other uh, effect of we get to vet the source code and uh, w we get to compile it ourselves and, and uh, make sure that everything is working relatively okay. It will also help us be able to do more testing on the program in general. So I'm pretty excited about it. Building a piece of software that's designed to work with games where it's a weird industry because basically every game is its own island and uses its own renderer. Even when everyone's using Unreal or Unity or a handful of engines, like there's still constant, constant challenges. I, I have to imagine getting render X to capture right with the game capture uh, source or or whatever it happens to be. Like how much of your time is spent you know, maintaining functionality versus with new renderers or new OSs or new updates to Windows or Mac OS or whatever it happens to be versus like looking at, hey, what, what can we do to drive this whole thing forward? It's actually been kind of a pain to deal with all the new rendering technology sometimes. Uh, for example, I think only in the like last two or three years have we actually properly implemented like Vulkan support for capturing Vulkan games, which actually ended up being probably the best capture method. Uh, if if a game is using Vulkan, that's going to be a happy time for uh, OBS. But if it's using DirectX uh, 12, not going to be quite as happy as a time, but uh, we still managed to figure it out in either case. We had this issue for like the longest time to where there was like this stuttering issue with uh, Direct3D 12. And uh, it was a nightmare because I didn't really know what to do. And I didn't, I don't really understand the new renderer stuff. I'm only experienced with uh, single threaded pipelines and uh, Vulkan and Direct3D12 are the multi-threaded pipelines. You know, they add their uh, more <laughs> down to the metal, so to speak. So I wasn't experienced with them. So I basically had to rely on other people to be able to fix that one, that particular uh, issue up. And then there's also the issue of uh, Apple deprecating OpenGL on Mac OS. <laughs> I don't know if they'll ever actually remove it, but uh, we rely on OpenGL for uh, non-Windows operating systems. And it's basically a situation where it's like we have to write like a metal renderer, which is a brand new renderer for our software. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if when the heck we'll ever get around to that. How closely do you work with the operating system vendors or, or do you at all at this point? Are you just a, a customer at this point? We work with them sometimes. Uh, sometimes they come around and uh, email us and connect with us and, you know, try to work on issues. Uh, we are quite friendly with the GPU vendors uh, so or the GPU hardware manufacturers like NVIDIA and AMD and Intel. So if we need something, we can basically contact them and say, hey, can you figure out like who to contact at Microsoft or or maybe Apple or something like that? Apple is actually quite difficult to get in contact with uh, or to report bugs for as well. But even they have uh, contacted us um, uh, at some point. So I wanted to ask about some of your advanced functionality 
So I actually use OBS with uh, FFmpeg's SRT support. SRT, you know, being a, a more modern kind of lower latency streaming protocol yep. to stream video to a coworker who then kind of composites it into a larger scene and restreams it. We kind of share gameplay back and forth that way at a very high quality, low latency enough that it's it's actually suitable for rebroadcast. Like, do you feel like there's a lot of other untapped potential in OBS kind of features like that lurking below the surface that, that people should be looking for? I feel like there's so much you could do with the API that people are unaware of. The API or the scene structure is basically a basic hierarchical uh, scene structure, and you could create some incredibly complicated scenes. But making the program in such a way to where you can set it up to do those sort of things, I mean, it's mostly about like user experience. Uh, for the program, we focus on making the user experience very as easy as we possibly can. We're, we don't always succeed at that, but um, at the same time, if you make things s super easy, it kind of hinders the ability to do advanced stuff in some ways, or makes it a little bit more difficult to do more advanced stuff, if that makes sense. And uh, internally, the system is capable of so much. I mean, you could have like countless streams running at the same time under the same compositor. You could have like this incredibly complicated uh, hierarchical mix structure, and it would be mixing uh, audio and video automatically behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to be able to get that complicated structure to the user. We're not really sure how to do that. Uh, and we're not even sure if we should do that at this point, because uh, it pretty much provides things for like 99% of the people. And that's really the important thing. You could end up down a bad rabbit hole if you spend too much time in niche stuff. One thing I am curious about is if you're finding that more folks who are kind of UI or UX experts are starting to come into the open source world more, you know, because that is the classic problem, right? Is how, how do I take this complicated functionality and make it in an application that's simple enough for people who don't necessarily need that complicated functionality to, to, to use? Yeah, that is the question. I'm clearly not very good at answering it. And I uh, wish that I had um, proper user experience designers uh, from the start, but you know, uh, it, it's not not that bad as it is. Uh, you know, sometimes certain things in the program are a little bit janky. Uh, sometimes we're limited by the uh, toolkit that we use, you know, Qt or Qt. And uh, it makes it kind of difficult for us to do everything that we want. But uh, yeah, I, I wish that I could have thought about it a little bit more from the beginning. So things aren't quite as janky as they can be, you know, having like a separate filters window or having like a, even things like the plugin system or, you know, the hotkey section. Uh, there's, there's so many things like, <laughs> or the advanced audio settings. You know, it's like, how do you get like those advanced features, you know, in front of the users without them being like overwhelmed? That's the thing that I care about the most is I don't want users to be overwhelmed when they open, open the program. And uh, I feel like for the most part, we succeeded with that. But uh, I feel like we kind of got stuck uh, in a lot of ways, like those examples I listed. Uh, it's just like, what do you do there? You know, how do you how do you get users those ad that advanced functionality without like shoving in their face 24 seven. I have to imagine you have people using OBS on all, all the continents and you know, are, are people, are, do, you, do you know if people are using OBS in space at any given point or uh, what's the <laughs> weirdest place you've heard of OBS uh, being used? I'm not sure if there's really any weird places that it's been used. It's more like weird applications that it's been used for. Uh, I know that NASA, I'm pretty sure has used it at some point because I remember getting an email from them and you know, going through their security procedures, you know, you know, just to get it approved for them to use. And they had to, you know, ask me a whole bunch of questions about it. And, I, and uh, so that was interesting. I'm pretty sure some governments use it as well and things like that. It's pretty nuts. Was it tempting to say to the government, hey, the source is just open. You can go look at it yourself. <laughs> well, the, I mean, it's usually just like, uh, checking you know the authors and you know checking the software and you know i usually try to say stuff like that but you know it's just standard procedures that you have to go through when when nasa comes calling i guess it's kind of a slightly different protocol <laughs> So that's OBS. Thanks to Jim Bailey, of course, for coming by and sitting down and talking to us for our first episode of the of the FOSS pod. Yeah, it's honestly kind of an honor to talk to somebody at the heart of such an important piece of Internet infrastructure. It's literally a tool I use every single day.
Yeah, totally. And and that ended up being my favorite part of the interview, hearing him talk about just like the nuts and bolts, nitty gritty, like the future of where it's going, features that they would like to add and stuff. I mean, hearing him talk about that AV1 support, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in internet video out there. He's just starting to expose that stuff in OBS and a lot of the other major software out there isn't really employing it quite as much yet as well. But like very, very low sub 500 millisecond latency and like super high quality. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on out there. And like, I'm, I'm so fascinated to hear him talking about the plugin manager, the potential for a, an overlay on top of games, which I agree would be fantastic to have. It's really exciting to hear him talking about a lot of that stuff. I guess I realized it, but I hadn't really considered it before talking to him was how much of the work he can only do so much to push things forward. Right. At the end of the day, it's up to Twitch and YouTube and and Facebook and, you know, all the other streaming services and the hardware vendors to give him the hardware and code and the and the endpoints for these new data code these new codecs and things like that you know so if he adds av1 support today it's great for people who record video but if you're streaming it doesn't do a whole lot of good because there's nothing to do with it at this point um right. but but anyway uh again if you want to know more about o- the obs project you should go to obsproject.com you can download the software there's a wiki there that has a ton of information about things you can do with it and the forums are an incredible resource for people who are learning to use obs uh, both in terms of uh, there's a wealth of knowledge collected over the years there and also a, a really great community of folks who are, who are happy to help out uh, people who are having trouble or, or have questions. Well, Will, I think that's our first FOSPod. Are you uh, ready to say the thing? The FOSPod is brought to you by Google Open Source, bringing all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. Find out more at opensource.google. I don't know if I'm ever going to get used to that. I'm just going to wait for the dot com every single it's a time. Perfectly fine, normal, top level domain, Brad. The sponsors have their own top level domain. I mean, hey, if, if you could get your own top level domain, you probably would, too. I, I, like, I'll take dot will. I'm available. <laughs> dot shoe doesn't exist yet. I would be <laughs> waiting to that. You could get dot maker and get shoe dot maker, though. Ooh, okay. Yeah. That's not the worst. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, I just want to say I am very excited to be doing this podcast. Like those who know me, including you yeah. know how much of my time outside of work I spend digging into open source stuff. Anyway, it's like, it's kind of the most exciting and inspiring thing out there on the internet to me in a lot of ways. And I'm just very excited to get to actually do it in some kind of officially official way. Yeah. It's, it's one of the few things that people do for the betterment of all humankind. That's really what it is for me. I mean, obviously, you know, you heard Jim talk about this some between sponsorships and Patreon and things like that. There are increasingly, it seems like there are a lot of ways for for people doing quote unquote free work on free software to make a living at this point. But still, at its core, the genesis of of, of a given project is not I'm necessarily I'm going to make a ton of money with this. It is like. I have a cool idea. I have these highly technical skills. I'm going to make a cool thing. Or I want this thing and it doesn't exist is the other big one, right? Yes, it's like it's a way for, you know, everyone benefits. And it's just I I find it uh, I find it to be a very appealing thing kind of philosophical. So anyway, visit opensource.google and you can find out more about Google Open Source. And we really appreciate the sponsorship for the show. We're excited about doing this. We're going to be doing it every other week. You can find out more at fospod.content.town. If you like the show, please subscribe in your favorite podcast app of choice. Tell a friend, leave a review. We love all of that stuff. And uh, you should check out our discord which is also linked at fosspod.content.town thank you all so much and we will see you all in a couple weeks with another episode thanks for listening thank you all so much and we will see you next week week after next (laughs) something like that